how do I follow that? <laughs> the house on Euclid Avenue. The dormer windows have lace curtains now, and she is elbows in. The wife who gardens in the yard below, among impatience, fuchsia, and her marigolds. Between wheelbarrow runs, her husband lobs a purple ball for their two blonde, busy sons. Wind chimes sprinkle silver music on the morning air. How could they know what happened in the attic 30 years ago? It was November, though, not blossom spring. All Sunday was impeached by industrial gray and cold. The, per the first blind hours of Sunday night Fat snowflakes flock the small Midwestern yards with white. In other homes, bright fires blazed. Pro football flickered on TVs. Why, why would they know what happened 30 years ago that brought shy neighbors out of doors and splashed the sleepy street with red and sapphire light? Snow silenced, silenced all except the crackling walkie-talkies of the cops and stoic EMTs. You could also hear somewhere the crest and fall of baffled human grief. Whoever might remember now has either died or gone away. Titmice and chickadees in hyphenated mindless flight reclaim this commonwealth of middle May. Whatever happened 30 years ago matters to only matters only to those of us who know, yet still don't really know. I come here maybe twice a year, though I never pause or stare. I puzzle over what it's meant. Sometimes I even think I understand. New sunlight crumbles through the freshened trees. Lilac and dogwood lace the modest yards in lavender and white. By now, I'm old enough to know that knowledge is an evanescent thing. Cornice and copper weather vane, chimney and attic, all bathe in the, in the first pure heat of spring. Just listen to the heartless robins sing. This is um, almost. The man behind me seethed. The lady behind him kept sighing, clicking her high heel on cold linoleum and scowling at her watch. The checkout boy was making change, snap, snap, one dollar at a time. He popped each bill between his chubby fingertips, glanced two times at the till, then smoothed his singles, fives, and tens down on the countertop. Each time, snap, snap glanced twice and smooth. The line was long and getting longer. Two guys in John Deere hats showed up, a mother and her infant. Good God, I heard somebody say. For crying out loud, kid. One woman slapped a pack of frozen peas against her cheek. The line was getting longer. A plumber, a cop, three busty girls with magazines and Diet Cokes. Did his mother have any children that lived? <laughs> the man behind me laughed. The lady just kept clicking her high heel. What happened next? I set my basket on the belt. I said, it's Rodney, right? He thumbed his name tag. He nodded yes. Hey, Rodney, let's get out of here. Forget these jerks, forget this crappy job. I tried to coax him out the way one might coax a bashful, beaten dog to come. It's just a job, I said. I may have even whispered this. Come on, it's just a job. He looked at me as if he didn't understand. It's just a job. And he refused at first. All I could hear was someone cracking gum, light music overhead, the click, click, clicking of a heel. We'll find you something else. 
After a lengthy pause, he scanned those fierce, exasperated faces in the line. Then he finally agreed. Someone clapped. Another whooped, hell yes, and praise the fucking Lord. He closed the register, stripped off his smock. Then we, we stepped out into 70 degrees. Viburnum bloomed and honeysuckle bloomed. Young parents strolled their baby down the street and kids played wiffle ball. A frail teetering man clipped rhododendron blossoms from a bush. On my front porch, Rodney sipped ginger ale. I drank fine caramel colored bourbon on the rocks. It's just, he started to say, then stopped. A cheerful bird, bird, bird insistence sprang throughout the leafy branches of my oaks. It's just I didn't want to disappoint my dad. I almost called him son. I almost said your dad, who surely loves you very much, will understand. I almost, almost cupped a gentle hand across his shoulder as he wept. Except, except he didn't weep. He started ringing up my things. Then Rodney told me what I owed. He bagged my tonic water and my chips. And he, before he counted back my change, apologized. It's just this thing I have to do. Walking to my car, I only heard the chiming clapper of a welcome bell, the sound of gravel crunching underneath my feet. Um, this next poem is um, it's called Big Lie, Little Lie. And uh, somehow it stumbled into the night I lost my virginity. <laughs> I'm sure some of you just did that in here. You're like, no. um, 200 lines, rhymed couplets about smoking hot, filthy, inexperienced, adolescent lovemaking. <laughs> what could possibly go wrong? <laughs> Um, it's not 200 lines, it's not. <laughs> it's not in rhymed couplets either. So. <clears throat> Big lie, little lie. All summer long, outside Duke's pony keg, at the chili parlor in the mall, I listened half in envy, half in awe, each time a kid came back from Hayseed, Indiana, or the beach, New Hampshire, or some faraway lake in nowhere, Arkansas, all hot Ohio summer long, at Putt-Putt Kingdom and the zoo, and in the mildewed, humid locker room at our public pool, I heard about farm girls and college girls, the easy, the insatiable, and the fast. All boring, hot Ohio summer long. I never doubted, not once, things I couldn't contradict myself about redheads and brunettes or the proven scientific facts about green eyes and hazel eyes, gymnasts and ballerinas. <laughs> or what Jack Barton told us once at Dairy Queen. Shit, ladies, listen up. I've done it with a housewife in her car. It was a Cadillac. <laughs> God damn, one of us said. Jack was two years ahead of us in school. God damn. <laughs> Sometimes I can still smell the heavy, sweet, almost vanilla air of fresh cut Cincinnati grass. I can still see the blue green evening cast the moment I, before I even knew I was about to lie had lied in West Virginia at my cousin's house, this older girl, you wouldn't know her. <laughs> I can still hear that ratchet, ratchet song of Katie Dids and the insistent spank and rubber echo of the basketball. God damn, even if they didn't believe me, they let me live that lie. But it was five years later, actually, in March of 1983. By then, two of those friends had moved. By then, the third had died. I was skinny and a little shy, with lots of feathered, soft brown hair. 
Rain rattled on the corrugated roof of her stepfather's cabin in the woods. Candles in old wine jugs, candles in jelly jars, and ashtrays blown from amber glass and green glass. Candles fragrant with cinnamon and pine. The whole room bloomed. A dusty sofa, the shotgun on the wall, bookcases and a hi-fi stereo. Our faces and our naked bodies bloomed in nervous pale gold candlelight. Why lie? Whatever happened then was brief, a sudden shudder into bliss, then gratitude, then something close to guilt. Sometimes I can still see her blonde hair rinsing down on me. She wore a slim, delicate chain that fell in silver twists and wrinkles like the rain. Why lie? Whatever happened then was nothing like it should have been. Whatever really is. I haven't told this to a soul, and even now in telling you, I'm not sure what I make of it. But something has troubled me for years. Our whole time in that candle-driven light, she had an almost angry look, some inward rage or bothered kind of fire. It flashed across her face. For just a little while that night, it darkened paradise and glittered in her blue, unblinking eyes. Easter Sundays. These yellow April evenings, I, no longer idealistic or inclined to wish my life were something that it's not, sip gin and tonics and enjoy a fragrant breath of just mown grass. Immaculately laned front lawns are flower crowned, our windows bright and clean. The lime wedge bobbing in my glass suggests an effervescent, new, and utterly surprising thought of green. Who could complain? Yet someone surely will about the pollen count or lack of rain. Not me. No one is happier than I to watch the sprinkler's grainy rainbow spill across broad vacancies of watered light or study sun-glazed copper weather vanes stamped against the cloud-flown April sky. But still, it happens nearly every spring, a blossom stroll through Holy Week, Good Friday off, a lull, and then that sadness Easter Sundays always bring. It's hard saying exactly why. It's not as if I even go to church, though there are those who wish I would. Why isn't it enough just being good? Extending charity, I mean, kindness, compassion, concern, and love, all things I like to think I do. Who needs an organist and choir, a brass collection plate, the priest, and an excruciating pew? The truth is, it's something that I've often understood, a deep desire to believe and belong, Communion in a stony, cool, and solemn atmosphere. Women who dress and smell like fresh-cut flowers. Men starched and ironed, splashed with aftershave. The comfort someone's looking after us. That kind of reassurance has a price. Worship with purpose, prayer on time, ice cream socials, driving kids to camp, reading to shut-ins, selling Christmas wreaths. It's not just enough being nice. And I suppose I understand this too. But what about the ones who get it wrong, who do all this and still despise the stupid and the ugly and the poor? Perhaps they celebrated God in song, tithed 10% and kneeled to pray, but then two-timed the marriage, harbored hate against their neighbors, screwed a friend or two, not even really anything that's new. It's just so dull. You'd think they'd preach a little less, not judge so much. But who am I to say? It's just so dull, that righteous indignation of the blessed. My next door neighbor hates my guts. 
At least when we talk politics, he does. He loves me like a brother, though, when we talk gardening, cooking, music, dogs. We plan long weekend trips we'll never take, wine country or the coast. Our families eat together once, a week or more. This isn't paradise, I know. This isn't paradise, it's only home. And yet, imperfect as it is, it would be difficult to disagree another Easter days away that home seems just about as flawless now as it may ever be. This is epilogue. Because the guests have all gone home and sunlight sculpts its late geometries across the littered lawn, because the time for such simplicities is rare, I'm sitting in a high-backed wicker chair as summer ends. The tireless bees that make the apple branches hum have found the garnish tray. They come in pairs, grow drunk on sprigs of mint and lemon wedges, then hover off to work the riches of their sweet tree. I'm thinking of our neighbor, Franklin Sloan, who spent this August afternoon persuading someone else's wife to walk the nature trail that skirts the lake. And of the lovely Mrs. Chase who sat in this same high-backed wicker chair, braiding and unbraiding her gold hair while Sloan persuaded her. Between the pines, a brightly sequined water shines, and they may be there still, reluctantly departing from their shore as small masts like tired arms of metronomes rock mildly in the geriatric wake of a pontoon boat that prowls the lake. And whether they regard their fall as frill or something more profound, I cannot say. It is no matter. The saw-toothed shadows of the ferns distend. A mound of cocktail ice grows clear beneath the boxwoods where it was pitched like some dismantled, melting chandelier. I regret to tell you, Mrs. Chase, you've left your pocketbook behind. It darkens by the cord of winter wood. A folding chair out on the grass where your fine yellow sweater hangs enjoys a soft cashmere embrace and evening's cloakwork steals the other half of your already half-forgotten face. The Night Guard at the Wilberforce Hotel. The drunks on 17, three San Antonio conventioneers, snoggle at long last in their clean beds. A naked man on five has woken to the latch and click of someone's lock, only it's his. And clear as Christmas crystal, there he is, dream dazzled in the hall, not even so much as a shower cap to hide behind. <laughs> a guest on 12 is calling to complain about the Indiana newlyweds whose bucking headboard batters at her wall. They've heard it also on the floor below, that beastly thumping racket, as if the whole ceiling could cave in, like something horrifying out of Poe. <laughs> but for the moment he has paused over a pleated mound of towels, a chilled half-eaten omelet on a plate, and cigarette stubbed in the last flat golden ounce of champagne in a flute outside room 728. He listens as a woman cries, and all at once, it's 1954. That was Kenosha, he is 10, a sleepless bathrobed little boy studying the thin strip of butter-colored lamplight underneath his mother's bedroom door. Though it's been more than 50 years, it is her quiet weeping that he hears as an old radiator knocks and whistles at the cold. Then he is jostled by an elevator bell, 
or just the hoarse pea gravel sound of someone making ice. Regardless, he is gone almost as softly as he first appeared, back to the handsome, chandeliered, and polished marble lobby where the night clerk and the married concierge flirt purely out of boredom's sake. Those rising and those still awake look out on cargo ships, inching through metal-colored lanes across the rain-strafed lake. Early autumn in Tennessee. Before October's gold veneer of leaf has covered the chilled creek and all the trees have grown antique with change, before the wind unveils each rickety and grim physique of maple, poplar, oak, and elm, the cotton downs the drying field like strange anachronistic snow. The monarchs come, the monarchs go. But still there are late swallow tails, the cloudless sulfurs too, that glow like incandescent lemon skins. Just yesterday the evening sky grew gas blue like a pilot light. The meadow purpled into night. And as a flock of grackles came, the black confetti of their flight seemed suddenly to shape a slurred, profoundly large and fleeting word against the cool and fragile dusk. At the meadow's far end, I heard the downward spiraling of song. It was a screech owl's shrill reply to what was written on the clear sky. Though really, who could comprehend the meaning of that mournful cry? The air was sweet with soil and hay. Two jet trails hooked a loose crochet across the writhing apple green and phlox blue of the dying day. It was a feeling more than a thought that those cold colors smoldering there seemed like the colors of despair or some unnameable regret. While such forebodings, it is true, will seldom sway the courts of law or topple legislative chambers, they may give prophets pause or make the brokenhearted exiles weep, and this for many is enough. In vino veritas. I know nobody's drinking too much here and saying things they regret the other day, or the day after. So, anyway. Over sliced apples and a wheel of cheese, pale crescent moons of honeydew, and three plump golden loaves of bread, we lift our glasses, lean them into light, and each of us, as through a jeweler's loop, admires the ruby and balsamic hue, or something in between garnet and tourmaline distilled into a rich molasses brown. Chocolate, someone muses. Michigan cherries and a kiss of sage. <laughs> Tobacco and the slightest ghost of clove. There is a lull until the fellow next to me identifies cracked pepper, orange zest, blackberry, and vanilla bean. Though not to be outdone, another says these grapes were punished early by the cold and wet, <laughs> then rescued through a long and providential miracle of sun. Who wouldn't want to call to mind a similar heroic year or recount with a dreamy look the way one woman does a weekend at this very same chateau? the vintner's ancient St. Bernard, his fetching broken English, and his wife's delectable coquille Saint-Jacques. It gets so boring anymore, listening to others tell you what they know, then somehow having to respond as if you truly cared. <laughs> and yet who can afford in proper company to say the other things out loud? In the two decades we've been friends, I've never really liked you very much. <laughs> Occasionally, I have imagined having sex with Maxwell's wife. Or this, all snowy afternoon, I've been uncomfortably aware that everyone I know will someday die. 
It's early still. I don't suppose if I slipped out to walk the frozen quarter mile home that anyone would notice, much less care. But surely I'll discern, I often do, after latching the deadbolt and the door, a different kind of quiet waiting there. Here there is laughter, talk of berries ripened on their summer vine, the elemental taste of husky fruit, mineral, and thyme. Two conversations over, I can hear Maxwell's intrepid voice grind on about our taxes and the goddamn poor. When three mole-colored silhouettes appear, two yearlings and a doe, their huge and darkly almond eyes. Half curious, half terrified, they freeze among the cedars looking in. And for a moment, it's enough to even make old Maxwell shut his yap. Three silent creatures on the silent snow, those peach and lightly rose pink evening clouds, and fastened like an antique pin above the cedars, also looking in, a giant pearl apostrophe of moon. My friend Bill Clarkson um, has over the years taught me a lot about wine. No, that's a lie. He's tried to teach me a lot about wine, and usually it's after a couple of martinis first. <laughs> and um, he, he heard me read that poem once, and he came up and he said, I've got one for you, Sweaty Saddle. <laughs> I was like, what in the hell? And um, you just have to hope that was an awkward moment, right? They're sitting around trying to figure out that last fragrance, and this guy says, wait, wait, I got it. After a long day on the steeplechase, do you guys ever? <laughs> anyway. It's true. After a long day on the steeplechase, they lick their saddles. You're right. Whatever you say. Okay. Um, this is epithalamian in a minor key. Having caught him in a slight and thoroughly inconsequential lie, we watched him turn from us and wade into a small, elegant cartel of, I'm sorry, let me start over. Epithalamian in a minor key. Having caught him in a slight and thoroughly inconsequential lie, we watched him turn from us and wade into a small, elegant cartel of women beneath a water oak, where he, where he now smokes a cigarette alone. The evening has the glazed and calm, enameled look of ornamental eggs. Tree branches are laced with paper lanterns and necklaces of tiny ivory lights. Filled water goblets gleam. The bride-to-be, wearing a lemon cocktail dress and pearls, seems chiseled from the very sun. We know few people here and find ourselves in conversation with a gas and oil man from Baton Rouge two groomsmen and the shy, well-meaning priest, a surgeon from Rhode Island, and then we're somehow milling next to him again. He'd like to clarify a certain thing he may have said before. We wave it off. Don't be absurd. This weekend, our causes are benign. We mingle. We manage to avoid opinion and belief, conservative and liberal, hawk and dove, Big Ten and SEC. <laughs> no one, so far as I can tell, is giving anybody grief over abortion or Afghanistan, gay marriage or the Fed. We're overly solicitous instead, accommodating and sarcasm free. Nobody scoffs or sneers. Nobody says, you poor uneducated schmuck, you've swallowed all the propaganda, eh? Miraculously, we find only pleasantries to say about the long distances we've come and the picture-perfect weather. We praise this rented stone estate, its columns, the Italian marble stairs, and dazzling cut glass chandelier. We remark how smitten they both look. The almost bride and nearly groom were here to celebrate. Tomorrow in the stained glass chapel light, wood polish and the pepper scent of lilies hanging in the godly air, a few may cry. 
A few may privately suppose there are no happy endings waiting there. Someone will screw around or worse, someone will have to watch the other die. To see them though, so pleased, so poised, so dashing and so overjoyed, it isn't difficult to think that these just may be the seldom two who will never raise their voices in a rage or covet some lost solitude, whose gentle, healthy children will obey, whose mild hearts may on occasion drift, as even mild hearts will sometimes do, though never truly stray. After the psalm and organ-driven hymns, after the homily, the vows, that kiss, wishing them happiness, if nothing else, we wish them all of this. Insomnia at 46. Hours like these, we sit here in the satisfying dark. Wind whistles at the chimney cap. A bird's eye maple clock keeps cadence knock by hollow polished knock. Though she's been dead 10 years, mother and I explain ourselves. Together we admire the blue reversals of the mantle mirror, the cat-like quiet of our street, and her antique mahogany buffet. Hours like these, there seems so much, yet even we both know there is little left to say. My mother, who was never very young or happy or at ease, and I agree. Our history seems ever slight beneath each cold, unshattered, far-flung star. Antares, Castor, Vega, Akamar, that crackles in the midnight overhead. I prefer to think I would know how to love her many sorrows better now, and she suspects that's true. Hours like these, the disapproving boy I was still sees her raging inward long debates, those fixed, bewildered, and pinched purse lips, the subtle tremor of her head. What were you saying, mother, and to whom? And what, in turn, from that strange other room was also being said? Pardon and Amnesty. A month ago, ice faceted the willow. Our first forsythia and daffodils were stunned beneath a pellet glaze of sleep. And for a raw few days, the punk of winter fires reclaimed our dismal street. But other flowers now are freshly sunned. Flamingo pink azaleas and the rose. A dust of violets blurs the college lawn, and all these creamy dogwoods having tussled out of bud enjoy a dry, delicious April flood of greenery and shine. A colleague I despise has brought his freshman class outside. <laughs> Gathered like goslings at his feet, some nod, some pick at grass. Wind flips the unread pages of their books. It's poetry, I overhear him say. <laughs> the spirit's ancient longing voice, a pure expression of the human soul. He is all hogwash and hot air. But even in the blossom-softened trees, the cardinals and the mockingbirds declare it's just that kind of day for song or saying something generous or grand, or at the very least, not small. And Jesus, Anderson, what's wrong with that? Besides, his students tend to like him more than yours like you. <laughs> I wonder when that started being true, or rather, when it started meaning less. Like tufted white chiffon, clouds cruise the stained glass blue Ohio sky, 
And in the golden post-meridian decline of afternoon, groundskeepers weed and mow. To them, we're just two lucky bastards who teach twice a week and take the summers off. Surely we must be chums. Fat chance. No shot in hell. And yet these days it gets more difficult to find reasons to not be kind. The bitchy shrill remarks and self-regard harder to justify. Aprils are fewer now. Perhaps that's why. Or maybe I just finally understand silence and letting be are better things. I should be better at them than I am. Thank you.